Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this recap video. It's been a few weeks since we've actually done one of these because we were trying to make the most of our cool weather. I mean, it was just an absolute gift. The weather we were given and tons of rain and moisture, not a ton of wind. Right. I mean, a little wind. Yeah, a little but bit, not but a not, lot. not bad. Not like we've seen the last couple of years. I think last spring was the windiest spring I can ever remember. Yeah. So it was like an absolute gift. So we tried to do as much work as we could outside, which means that we didn't spend time in here or you know some anywhere sitting and um, you know discussing questions and stuff. So I think uh, Aaron, you grabbed questions from the last seven videos. Mm -hmm. So we did miss a few in yeah. there. But uh, anyway, we will be doing these on a more regular basis now that it's warming up. In fact, today's only supposed to be 90, which I'm thankful for. That's not horrible. We're gonna start placing stones out in the South Garden. I think that's really gonna help that area. Well, actually, the stones will look good, but when we put the compost down, yeah. that's what's gonna make it look really nice. Like, you know, and all the plants are looking good out there, but when you can see exposed, like our dirt is white, you know, when it um, dries out. And so it was previously mulched with compost, which is dark, but then when you aug holes, it just kicks out a bunch of the mm -hmm. white soil, and then you can see all the drip tubing, and it just tends to make it look a little messy. Yeah. So when you get that layer of mulch down, oh, is going to be pretty yeah also i think having those stones placed will help um really form that area because then we'll know where we need larger things you know um, and or smaller things you know perennials you'll be able to put perennials all the way around yeah. that'll look nice i think it'll look really pretty so that's the plan for today but monday which is just four days away from now we're supposed to be 104. No, really. <laughs> I honestly like above 80. I'm not, I don't really dig temperatures above 80. Like 50 to 70 is just, oh, is prime for me. Yeah. But it will help things grow. So that's good. We'll, well see. Well, if you work growth. outside, you know, like 50 degrees can even get warm. Yeah. If you're in the sun, if you're really, you mm -hmm. know, going at it, working. So, you know, it's funny. Aaron was looking up uh, Disneyland last yeah. night because my uh, brother and sister in law and niece and nephew just went to Disneyland. And so we were trying to decide, like, okay, at what point should we go? You know, because Samantha's only one and a half. Should we wait until next year or just go? Because Benjamin, you know, would really enjoy it right now. Anyway, we were trying to look at what time of year would be the best and what do you think january <laughs> it said that the, there's the least crowds like january and february and um, the temperatures and honestly january would be the best time for us too well it would yeah in terms of gardening and the high temperatures are like 69 70 yeah. average which is fantastic so anyway that might be when we plan to go that was a total side note but let's just jump into the videos from the past seven days the first one is uh shopping for trees at the garden center so uh, Aaron and I went down with kind of a specific, we, we wanted more evergreens. We really still want to work on getting more evergreens planted in the garden. Um, and we ended up with five or six trees. I can't remember exactly how many, probably six. I'd have to yeah. go back and look, but yeah, I don't remember either. <laughs> it was a handful of just beautiful things. And then we came home and planted them. Uh, and we're going to try to do that. The garden center still has an amazing selection of stuff. So we're going to try to try to do that every few weeks or so. Just go pick out just a small handful of things to add to the garden. So Emma Sass, her last name Sass. I wish my last name was Sass. Yeah. That's awesome. Don't Sass now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Laura and Aaron, I look forward to your videos every day. I don't know if you realize how much of a joy uh, you bring to others' lives. I laughed a lot during this one between Aaron trying to get a tree at, the, at a discount for the, <laughs> that limb. I remember that. You know, I wonder if people thought I was serious. Like, it was no. clearly a joke. I think if anybody's been watching for any amount of time, they yeah. know. Yeah. I, I, when I was editing, well, Ken edited it, but when I was reviewing it, I was like, I wonder if anybody will, like, think that I'm... I don't know, well, <laughs> like a penny wasn't. pinch or something. <laughs> uh, Laura driving the forklift while filming and Laura falling into the hole. Yes, I did fall into a hole in that video. I love that you show real life and I can see myself falling into a hole like that. I'm glad I'm not alone. Um, it's such a relief every day to watch your videos. I'm currently going through chemo and immunotherapy and just want to forget about that for a while. Your videos let me do just that. Oh, Emma, thank you for that comment. I'm sorry for what you're going through. Prayers and, and thoughts to you. Michelle says, Laura, do you aerate your trees? I saw an auger. I saw on the auger website you can aerate your trees with an auger, but I'm not finding any videos regarding this. Is this something I should do for my young trees? The last time I used an auger around a tree, I broke a water main. <laughs> Remember that? I was trying to fertilize a plum tree oh, that doesn't yeah. even exist anymore. We took it out because it was sick. That's why I was trying to fertilize it. We weren't, we didn't plant it. It was here when we moved in, and I just was using an auger in the grass. 
and it hit not like a sprinkler line. It was like a water main, remember? And Benny, we called him, and it was a, uh, on a oh, weekend. Oh, yeah. He came on like a Sunday or it, Saturday yeah, or he Sunday? Yeah, was like a funeral or a memorial service that morning, and I didn't know that, but yeah, he came be, right after. Yeah. He was like, well, I was at a funeral, and you know, I was like, Benny, you could have <laughs> just like maybe directed me on how I could have patched it until you could have come. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. So no, we don't aerate our trees. I don't know a lot about that. Do you? I know that um, some people use those. I don't know if this is the same thing. I don't, I don't know what aerating a tree is, but here's what I do know is that at nurseries, sometimes they'll put them in like those, what are those called? The grow bags? Yeah. And they air prune because the roots get to the end. Mm -hmm. And so instead of like circling a plastic pot, what they'll do is the root will get to the end of the bag. Uh -huh. It'll see the air or, or feel the air and then it'll head back a different direction, but it won't circle. And so I know that's called like air pruning. Well, wouldn't it eventually circle if it only has a limited amount of space? No, it like if? heads back a different way. It doesn't keep growing. Like the root stops there and goes a different direction. Like so it, it like branches branch, off? Yeah, it branches. Oh. And I guess that that's better because then you've got more point, more nutrient points for yeah, nutrients to get sense. in. Um, and that's the whole point of like biotone is that it creates better branching for the roots because it, it um, creates more openings in the right. roots so air pruning is like a similar idea so i don't know if that's what i wonder what, why more things aren't grown like that maybe just like a water issue they dry out maybe too yeah, quickly you might, need or... to, might only work in like super rainy areas like for us in really dry areas oh, maybe it would it, be hard to keep them wet yeah, yeah so maybe you need to live in a humid place i'm not really sure I, we're not growers so i don't really that's know. an interesting concept yeah. though uh, Fee Dad Bill one said, can you explain what it means when a plant tag only lists one growing zone? It annoys me when a tag only lists one growing zone. So typically good tags will give you a, a like a range, like a zone four through nine, say. Um, if a tag says just like zone four, that means that the plant is hardy down to a zone four, which is like negative 30 degrees or zone five, negative 20 degrees. This is all Fahrenheit. Um, so if a tag gives you a range though, like zone four through nine, then you know that that plant will thrive up to a zone nine, um, meaning that it can't be higher than a zone nine, like grown in a zone 10 or 11, because it does need a certain amount of cold hours in order be, to be productive. So it all has to do with like winter temperatures and how much cold the plant can withstand. Uh, and so there's an occasion, I, I think I just planted some maybe nepeta that just said hardy to zone five. Mm. I'm like, well, that's great. I know it'll survive in our area, but what about somebody growing it in a zone nine? Will it survive there? Or will it, does it need to be grown only up to a zone eight? I think the reason companies do that, well, it's not even companies, it's growers, I think, that put that on the tag, is that it's like localized tags where like, let's say you're in Minnesota, you're growing these plants in Minnesota and they're only shipped inside Minnesota. Well, like, you know that, you know, there's no zone nine in Minnesota. You know, no. there's no zone, there's probably no zone seven in Minnesota. So they only put the lower zone because it's a, the higher zone is irrelevant because it's not going to get shipped down to Florida and they know that. So I think that's why some tags only have one zone because it's like a localized thing. Cause I've noticed that at the garden center, it seems like, like proven winners does two zones because they know that their plants might go to Florida, might go to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have that. But a lot of people just ship locally. Do you think I'm wrong? Maybe. <laughs> I I'll mean, bet, maybe you're I'll right. I'll bet you won't find a national brand that doesn't list two zones. I'll bet you'll only find local growers that do one zone. Really? If you were to look at all the tags. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's just something I've never thought about. So you gotta kind of like think of all the possibilities here. What are you looking at? Nothing. <laughs> None of your business. I don't want to throw any company under the bus though. <laughs> So, uh, and you know, honestly, their website's probably different from the tag. That's also something that can What'd be... What'd you look at? Monrovia well, I looked or something? at Monrovia, and on the website, it did say zone four through nine for just a random juniper that I looked up. I'll bet Monrovia um, does it. I'll bet... Isley doesn't. Uh, they list But like, Isley only grows in Oregon, no, and I'll bet they only ship to No, around, they ship all over the place. Oh, do they? Well, I think maybe. they don't. I'll bet Isley is local, and that's why they do it. Well... It's an Oregon grower, and they probably only ship to, like... Although if some of their stuff was going down to California, you well, need... I think I've seen a, uh, um, a map. Hold on, yeah, they they look at. They, they have different room? sales reps for different areas of the country. Oh, but you know their tags. Like I don't have a tag here. Usually I have a stack of tags in here. 
but I recently did some organizing. <laughs> so I think I probably put them somewhere else. Anyway, um, some websites will show a lot more information than the tag will show. And yeah. anyway. That is odd though that Isley would ship somewhere where it's possible they could be shipping higher than what the growing zone of you that know, plant though, is. The thing is, and that's why I said I don't want to throw any company under the bus, their sales reps are probably really good. Like the one for, you know, the, the South. Yeah. Um, southeast, they probably have a very tailored list available to them. Like stuff that wouldn't survive down there, it's probably not even available to them on an order form. Yeah. Because they know where they're at, they know what zone they're in, so they probably don't even see those as an option, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. It's probably organized a lot better than, you yeah, know. Yeah, that'd be interesting. We need to get a Isley sales rep on the, on the line. <laughs> uh, Lori said, what do you do with those huge pots that the trees come in? I think Paul took those, the ones we didn't cut. Occasionally we have to cut one, which feels like a complete waste to me because they are such thick, good pots. Um, but sometimes you cannot, unless you have a machine, I guess, I cannot get the trees out. Yeah. Like you and I have tried real hard to get some trees out. Right. And sometimes they're like, they're so rooted in that mm. they're almost pushing the pot out. And you know, the top isn't pushed out because there's a lip. So it's much uh, tighter up there. It's kind of like planting in an urn that has like a, a reservoir like this, like the opening at, top, at the top is a lot tighter. Um, so sometimes we have to cut them, but uh, I do rehome the big ones. And occasionally we keep a few of them because I'll use them when I harvest stuff. So I can put like potatoes in a big um, container or whatever. Your parents like to keep them at the nursery too, Yeah, don't in they? fact, For... when I have a, a stack of like really good premium containers, like the real strong ones, even one gallon size, there's a difference. Sometimes they're grown in flimsy pots that you can crush just by stepping on them. And sometimes they're like the blooming nursery pots are really mm. strong. Um, and we use those as pot risers. When you do a display and you want to stack several ceramic containers, one on top of the other to make like kind of a pretty display, we use empty containers for sure. that. So anyway, I've also got some flats that we need to take back to the garden center mm. because they return them to like specific places will take back flats mm -hmm. and reuse them, which I think is awesome. And so I try to help wherever we can with that. Uh, Cry Bastion said, uh, what do you think of placing artificial rock covers to tuck in near your mechanical boxes? I want to get one for a tall rectangular box I have, uh, but I haven't pulled the trigger because most look too artificial. But I plan to get one and hope to paint it to make it look more natural. We've, we have a We've few. We've had really good luck with them. Yeah. Uh, they do, when you kind of look at them closely, they look artificial, but if you're just kind of scanning an area, you would never really know. We had up in the front, we had um, a couple large real rocks and then a one fake rock and you couldn't tell the difference I between the real the ones thing, and the fake making one. Making like a grouping maybe instead mm. of just one lone rock, you know? Or if you're kind of shred, like let's say you planted a couple grasses or something, mm -hmm. you know, nothing like pokey or something around your mechanical stuff, but something mm -hmm. that can easily be kind of moved around. Mm -hmm. I think if you kind of sh sort of shroud the, the b artificial box as well, then I it say go blends. for it. Yeah, we've ordered them on like Amazon, Amazon yeah. and had pretty good luck. In fact, there's one over a uh, something near the Hartley. Mm -hmm. Benny put it over there. That yeah. I think just. I think it was just hanging around. Um, it, we're gonna eventually have gravel over the top of that box. Uh -huh. So if we ever need to get in there, we'll just have to kind of scoot the gravel away. Mm -hmm. Won't be a big deal. But I noticed it out there. I'm like, that doesn't look bad, and it's covering something, so it's yeah. protected. So that's good. Right. Yeah. Sometimes you uh, forfeit a little bit of. I don't know. The convenience of it is worth it, is what yeah. you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you'll put up with a little bit of fake rock look. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if it's protecting something and keeping you from driving over it or somebody else from driving over it. Kat said, so beautiful, love all the new trees. Question, there seems to be a jingling noise in your videos of late that sounds like metal bracelets knocking together. What is that? We're not sure. <laughs> It's I, when I'm moving around. Yeah, I think it's either your hair touching the microphone or your clothing but as it, you move. The thing is, is that like with my hair, my hair is always down mm -hmm. and I've been wearing a mic for a lot of years now and it's not, I don't think it's my hair because I think we would have noticed it more frequently. Oh, I've noticed it for years. It, it's it's a different sound. It is like, um, like there's change in my pocket. Yeah. Um, or like I have metal bracelets on, which I don't. In fact, I even forgot to put my ring on this morning. I'm not like, <gasps> I'm not a huge jewelry wear, jewelry wearer, uh -huh. um, and yeah, I've been noticing it like um, in a recent out outro. I was talking like toward the end of the video, and it was like I'd talk with my hand, and then every time I would set it down, it was like oh. something would shift against the mic, and I looked. I'm like, am I wearing something with buttons or a zipper or something? 
We should run some tests. We should. To find out exactly what it is. Yeah, it's annoying though, and I don't, you know, I, I don't, don't really mean know how for to fix to it either. I don't know. We'll have to, yeah, run some tests. Yeah. Good idea. Janine said, does anyone else think they have the same amount of garden space as Laura and Aaron? After every video, I say to myself, I want that, and I want that, and yes, I want that. <laughs> My husband has to keep reminding me that we only have about a quarter of an acre. <laughs> Do you ever like dream about having, I mean, it, you don't want to sound like ungrateful or anything because it's awesome to have the space we have. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, don't oh, well, you kind of... I think eventually we'll want to scale it back a bit. Eventually, yeah, one day. like later, later on. Yeah. It's so fun. All the projects we're doing right now, it is fun to see things evolving. And I wish, like part of me wishes I could jump forward and see what it's going to look like in five, ten years. Like uh, it was funny after our recent tour, Aaron put the drone up and got drone footage of the South Garden. And I'm looking at that thinking like, how, what have we done? Yeah. Like, how, where are all the trees? <laughs> but when you're standing at eye level, it looks a lot different. Yeah. Um, but I just, like a lot of those trees, they just need to grow. They're gonna get big. A mm. lot of those trees will get massive, but it all looks so dinky in the beginning, yeah. you know? And so part of me wants to, to race forward to be able to see what it's gonna look like, but then I don't want to, cause I don't want my kids to grow up. <laughs> it's like, I don't wanna race forward. I want time to stop right now. I don't know why I got onto that tangent, except for one day we might scale back. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense how I got onto that. Anyway. I just don't see how we could scale back. You know, well, once I'm you kind of like, like retirement. Put your, yeah, like retirement I suppose. Age. That's it's a long ways away. Yeah, it's a, it's a while away, but, um, so, and that's good. Yeah. Many, many years to enjoy. But I can see like kind of, um, well, even now, like I like to use augers because I don't want to get down a million times to plant mm -hmm. something. Um, it was a lot easier to do that 10, 15 years ago than it is right now. Yeah. You know, and I can see another 10 years from now slowing down, well, five years from now slowing down a little bit, and then another five years slowing down a little bit, and to a point where, unless we have uh, like a full staff here all right. the time, yeah. um, I want to be able to go on vacations with the kids when they're old enough to really enjoy it yeah. and, and do some things like that, mm -hmm. you know, which we don't do right now. Right. So. Uh, and you never know really what life's going to throw at you. And we try to keep a very real um, look on that. Yeah. A real, I mean, it, it doesn't that? appear that people are going to stop watching videos online anytime soon. That, sure. Like that looks like a trend that's going to, you know, but YouTube could change. I mean, right now, the way we make money is ads on our videos. That's mm -hmm. like the number one thing. So, but there's other ways that we could try to generate revenue as well. That's just how we're doing it now. But YouTube could change it in a second. And then all of a sudden, yeah, you know. You just never know. You like, never do you know remember when, um, when like the kids videos was like a huge deal? Mm -hmm. And then uh, everybody was scared to even just have a child in a video, like mm -hmm. to be seen at all. Mm -hmm. And so some people were like, I'm not going to show my kids at all. But um but yeah, like what if YouTube went back into our, you know, they had their little AI algorithm that's like, oh, we've seen kids in your videos, so we're going to demonetize your whole channel because mm. it looks like a kid's channel or something. Uh -huh. Things like that can happen. Yeah. So, so we try to keep a very real look. How come I can't think of the right word? A real outlook? Try to be realistic. Realistic. Yeah. I guess you could <laughs> say it like that. Yeah. We try to be realistic um, and always keep an open mind to what things could happen. And I don't know. You just never know. Yeah. Uh, next video is planting four varieties of daylilies, tough, low maintenance perennials. Yeah, so I had four varieties of daylilies that were just gorgeous and huge. I usually like to wait until things are in bloom so that when I'm showing you in a video, I can show you what the blooms look like kind of in real life. Um, but I just really felt like some of these needed to get out of their containers. They're just massive. Some of them were hard to get out of their containers because again, like daylilies especially, if you leave them into their, into their pots too long, they like really need the, the space to grow. Um, so I think that they're much happier out in the garden where they are. And I like daylilies uh, for the fact that not just, you know, for their blooms, but also for their foliage. I love the grassy texture that they add to an area. I think it adds, um, it just adds something that's needed yeah. without adding an ornamental grass, which I do like ornamental grasses, but if you can get both, you get the strappy grassy leaf and, leaf, and then you also get the bloom, even better. So Claire said daylilies are tough as nails. As a southern gardener and an archaeologist, I know that they take clay soil and moist soil like a champ. I've rarely ever seen them wilt in the heat either, and the plant colonies they form through spreading can last easily over 100 years. 
I find them still living and blooming at old home sites from the 1800s all the time. The basic orange variety was popular um, historically with yellow less commonly. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear that, like a historic look at daylilies, and they are tough, and they can take so many different types of soil, which makes them so nice and versatile, and you can find daylilies. I mean, maybe not exactly the varieties I planted, but daylilies are very common. common. And there's a lot of varieties out there to try. Um, there's one that only blooms once a season. It's like the Joan, uh, Joan something. It's a white one that's fragrant and beautiful. Mm. And I remember thinking when I worked at the garden center, I need to get that one in my garden somewhere. Don't have it yet, but I will. And it's super common. Mm. That's one that we had every single year at the garden center. I wonder so. if they're so tough because their root system, like the way they grow in the plant cans, mm -hmm. I wonder if they do that in the ground too, where their, sure. their roots are just really prolific. Yeah. And so they're, they find water easily and, and they just roll. Yeah. yeah. And it's nice to add stuff like that into the garden because we add some stuff that we either have no experience growing and we know and, or we know is finicky to grow. So it's nice not to have everything like that. Yeah. It's okay to have a few things that you can fuss with, but like the rest the incredible of it, hydrangeas. <sighs> like they're really pretty. I yeah. love them. Yeah. But they're a pain in the butt. Oh my gosh. I mean, I don't know if it's where we have them. They're gorgeous where we have them, mm -hmm. but the amount of attention we have to give that plant, not maintenance, but water. Yeah. Like if you are not on it with water with those plants. At oh. the right time of the day. Yeah. It's it like they'll be... wilt at around like noon-ish mm -hmm. unless you're watering right at that time. And it doesn't matter how much water you put on them if you're not like giving them water at that time. Yeah. And we are giving them water through the drip system at that time, yet we still have to pull hoses out. Yeah. And we move a hose. So like Bethany, Paul, and I, and sometimes you, like throughout the day we know that there's a hose sitting on a hydrangea. If you walk by, you move it to the next the next one. I think what we should do is we should have a drip system for the whole area, uh -huh. but then we should have a separate drip, drip system, uh, like just one line, mm -hmm. just for how many hydrangeas? Like eight of them or something? There's Nine? Seven or eight. Seven? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just run one line, put a couple of emitters right at the root ball of each of those, mm -hmm. And then just tie that into the hose so yeah. you can just screw it into the hose turn so it on all and of them all of them it. get water and you only do that basically on the like really hot days right you know if you know it's going to be hot and it's sunny it's usually if it's like 95 or above yeah usually so it's not like it's which is a lot of our summer yeah it's not i don't know the the thing about them too is we have a drip system going by them and we put extra emitters into that drip system just to those plants so that everything else is just getting normal water they're already getting extra yeah so <laughs> I don't know. They're so pretty though. And sometimes you're okay with that maintenance. Yeah. I'm like borderline on that one. Yeah. Uh, but then there's other hydrangeas that don't, are totally fine. They're not fussy. Right. Like the limelight is yeah. just like kind of a bulletproof hydrangea yeah, for us. It'll just grow wherever you put it. And the quick fires in the back yeah. corner, like mm -hmm. full sun, wind, whatever. And the limelight primes. Yeah. Like all the paniculatas. Really well. Yeah. Like if you want more of a, a bulletproof, mm -hmm. that's the one you should get. Yeah. Wisdom Rule says, interesting weather, what state is this? You know, this spring, I, it was interesting. Like, it felt like we were not in Eastern Oregon, which is where we're from. This is where we're at, um, high desert. It felt like we were on the western side of the state. Mm -hmm. I mean, rain like every day and hardly any wind and mild temperatures and overcast, like a ton of cloud cover. It just, it was something that we needed. Mm -hmm. Like, we desperately needed that this spring. And it's just amazing. Like usually by this time of year, we've been in the hundreds easily for, you know, a couple of weeks maybe. Yeah. And just now seeing a hundred degree temperature on the forecast. And I mean, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of hoping like, cause I can't see it the couple days after it. I'm kind of hoping that maybe that's like the hottest we get all yeah. summer and it just stays like Cools in the nineties and eighties. That would be amazing. Michelle said, Laura, do you know any type of lily is extremely toxic to cats and kills them quickly? I dug up and removed my daylilies when I brought home Siamese who likes to taste plants. Are daylilies toxic or is it just like the um, oriental lilies? It sounds like a lot of plants are toxic to cats. Let me look that if up If they really eat quick. them. Mm -hmm. Daylilies or he hemorrhocalis, hemorrhoc I don't know, so know if I'm saying that right, that's a botanical name, are safe for humans and dogs but are poisonous for cats. Interesting. Okay. So, um, the true lilies are poisonous to dogs. Um, day lily, I'm just trying to get a little bit like, is it the pollen or is it if they actually eat the plant? Um, yeah, leaves, petals and pollen for, for cats. Boy, my cats have never been, I don't know. I think animals have instincts too. Um, maybe if that was the only thing in your yard, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. only thing they had access to, maybe they would mess with it. 
Um, it's not something I normally worry about um, because I don't know. I feel like most of the time animals stay away from stuff like that. Ours don't tend to bother anything. Mm -hmm. Like we do have true lilies out in the cut flower garden too. And we had some of them bloom last year, like a couple, and we're going to have a much more of them bloom this year. But I'm not even, I'm not worried about it. The only thing it. I've seen our cats mess with is like grasses yeah. where they kind of gnaw on them. Yeah. Um, that's it. Yeah. But that's pretty common, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they don't mess with our cat mint. I get questions about that a lot. Yeah. We have a lot of hellebores and stuff in the garden too, which I think are toxic to like maybe everything. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of those. I'm not, no. Nobody, nothing ever bothers them. I mean, never say never, right? You don't want to say that it could never happen, but. Allison said, insane weather changes. How is it affecting your growth rates? Well, you know, I do notice that it has stalled things a little bit because mm -hmm. it was so cool, which is totally fine because now once we get all of this heat, stuff will just boom. Uh, but it's made everything just look so much more lush and much Best healthier. Best year for roses. Best year for roses ever. Yeah. Most of the time, roses are struggling a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but like the, the bloom... Um, the amount of blooms is just crazy this year and everything just looks so green and lush. And I think too, spider mites have been a little bit more delayed than oh, normal sure, yeah. because they like it hot and dry and they have, they weren't able to get that. So I did notice my first spider mite infestation on the hollyhocks up by our front door, which I did spray with spinosa. I need to go check them today. I would really not, I would really like to not have to cut them back. Um, my my uh, thought was, because it is pretty thick, was spray them where they're at so it kills the adult activity so that when I'm cutting them back, because it moves the plants around a lot, I don't want to spread those adults everywhere in the area. So I thought I'm going to spray them where they're sitting and then come in and cut them all back and get rid of these plants completely. Because, you know, if you miss just a handful or like two spider mites, they can take back over really quickly. Um, so I'm going to need to check them today and mm -hmm. see what's going on. And I might need to cut them back, which would be a shame because they're just starting to bloom. Mm. EN said, do you not use the word structure in English? Like I hear a lot of people use texture for everything because the texture of these plants is uh, matte, rough, whatever. The structure is like an ornamental grass. I was just wondering. We use the word structure. But I feel like you use the word texture more though. Well, I'm using uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, when it comes to the texture of leaves. Yeah. Because some are wispy and fine mm -hmm. uh, textured, and some are bold and strappy textured. Mm -hmm. I use structure in more of a hardscape sort of uh, setting, I think. Mm -hmm. Like more of a, or maybe trees. Like I need a, a structure of a, like I need it to be a pyramidal structure. Sure. Or shape. I would probably use the word shape. Mm. I'm not sure. I haven't thought about that ever. Now you will. Yeah, I will, yep. Maria said, can you do a video about edging the grass and keeping beds tidy ongoing? I don't edge grass anymore. It just takes a trimmer turned upside down, like vertical, mm -hmm. and you just, you can, maybe once a year, you can go with a flat shovel oh. and define, yeah, you know, your bed the way job. you want it to be. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, it's just like mowing the lawn. You just gotta stay on stay every week, every time you mow, just trim it, Mm -hmm. You know, straight up and down, and that's how you do it. Boy, it weeding, makes everything look good. Weeding is pretty much the same. You just got to do it. Yeah, like there's no it. there's no magic to it. It's not like there's some like amazing method. Although, like Paul likes to use a hula hoe. Yeah, so does Bethany. As opposed to getting yeah. down and pulling them, but so I, I guess I used to be a firm proponent and no no tools. Really, you pull those things out by the roots. But then when you get more space and it takes a lot longer you, and you don't want to bend over that much, yeah. you kind of relax a little bit on that. Marilyn said, Laura, do you dare share with us some of your favorite nurseries in the Ada County area? Ada County. What is that? Boise. Boise? Mm -hmm. So we go to uh, Far West on occasion. We go to Franz Witte, which is not Ada County. That's like Canyon, Canyon County. County. Um, we've gone to Edwards a few times. They have a lot of hard water standing on their plants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, are there any others that we visit over there? No, pretty much just far west and, and Franz Witte. Franz Witte. Those two are have we go to Jaker, really good but that's a that's Jaker's a, a wholesaler. Yeah, wholesaler. Yeah, I think people could go look, right? I think that you have to be like working through a landscaper oh, to sure. get plants there. So like you can go on behalf of your landscaper who has like uh, an account with them. Mm -hmm. So you you can only buy through someone else. Sure, that makes sense. Next video is planting powerhouse perennials, four varieties of Nepeta and one Coreopsis. 
So I had some Cat's Meow Nap at a plant, um, also some Neptune and Prelude Blue and, um, oh, I wanted to show you the cat's pajamas, how it was looking in the garden. Was there another variety? I feel like there was one more variety in Epida. Maybe not. Anyway, there were some really beautiful varieties down at the garden center. My uh, parents had just brought in this gorgeous load of perennials. And what my mom said, uh, they contacted them and just said, hey, we're sending a truck up your way. Do you need anything? And my mom just said, just two flats of everything that's looking awesome right now. And so they got an amazing looking load of stuff. And then um, I got some Coreopsis, some uh, rosy shades or shades of rose Coreopsis, some like really dainty pink blooms. Um, so I was really excited to share with you those varieties because there were a couple that I hadn't seen before and I have no experience growing those particular varieties, but I knew that my cat's pajamas needed a little bit of attention. Some I sheared back and showed you how I do that. Um, and then just like the difference, there can be one category of plants, Nepeta, and you could find like hundreds of varieties out there. Um, and each of them needs to be treated maybe a little bit differently. Um, like the cat's meows and cat, uh, cat's, cat's meow and cat's pajamas, you share it back once in the season, maybe twice if you have a long enough season, and you get full re, re bloom. On the other two varieties that I planted, it just says to continue deadheading which, you know, I don't typically like a chore like that. If I have a whole bunch of them, I don't want to have to just go and deadhead a plant a ton of times. I just want to shear it back once and see what happens. But sometimes, again, like if you don't have a ton of them, like the Prelude Blue, I think I planted three of those. And I'm willing to go out there and deadhead those because I don't have a massive amount of that going on throughout the whole garden. But it's interesting to have different varieties in the same family just to see what they bring. Highland Lake Cottage says, this is my favorite poem by Emerson, and I think you've definitely succeeded. To laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social, social condition, to know even one life has breathed e easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. Oh my goodness. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Well, that is a beautiful comment to read. Thank you for leaving that. Wow. Lori H said, all oh, your little helper. What's the difference between Nepeta and Catmint? It is the same thing. Nepeta is a botanical name for Catmint. And I, did I forget to say that? Sometimes I get such uh, in such a, like a, I can't think of words today. <laughs> A zone. A zone. And when you're used to ordering plants by their botanical name, that's just how you think of them. Like red hot pokers, it's not a red hot poker to me, it's nephophia. Like that's mm -hmm. how I know it because that's how I had to order it in the past. Past, And I always try to throw in the common name and the botanical just in case because, you know, we all know things different by different names. But anyway, it's the same thing. Christine said, do you prefer the Nepeta or Salvia? And is there a reason why? Oh, Nepeta. <laughs> So far, the Nepeta outperforms uh, Salvia. I mean, they both bring something different. Pink Perfusion Salvia has been such an amazing variety in our garden, but it doesn't bloom quite as long as the Nepeta does. Um, so each one of them will bring a, a different structure, a different color, something a little bit different. They both attract pollinators like crazy. So on that front, they're both amazing. Snooky said, where do you suggest buying a really good pair of snips for cutting flowers, trimming down cat's pajamas? Mine just don't seem to last even though they are well taken care of. Please point me to a decent pair. Buy yourself a pair of Felco 2s or Felco 6. Felco 2s, I think, are for larger hands. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not in here. What? But I'm like, I organized way too much, put things away. Um, Felco 2s, I just have used for ages and they're awesome. Um, Felco 6 are kind of the same, but built for a smaller hand, right? I think so. Yeah. Um, so te technically, I think my hand could probably use a Felco 6, but I'm used to gripping the Felco 2 and I grip it weird. I grip it differently than like, I don't, I have one hand or one finger hooked mm. kind of over the top of one of the handles instead of actually using the handle. Oh. But I'm so used to doing that, that it's just second nature for me. But the wonderful thing about them, they're great tools, they're great quality, and you can get pieces and parts. If you need to replace a blade or you need to replace a bolt or something like that, you can spend a few dollars to get the replacement part instead of buying a whole new pair of pruners. Airplays YT said, please, how do you keep your roses so beautiful without Japanese beetles? We do not have Japanese beetles in our area. They're not something that we are afflicted with. Our main problem with roses are aphids, which are an easy, easy kill, you know, spinosad or, you know, a lot of times 
a lot of times we don't even deal with it. Like they just kind of disappear. Plant like Brussels sprouts or calendula nearby and your aphids will leave your roses um, and attack the host plants. Um, spider mites is another thing that you may be afflicted with in this area, but Japanese beetles aren't, aren't one of them. Lisa said, what brand are the two new for you Nepetas? I don't recognize the can. I've never seen any, uh, any like this. Are they new this year? I love the look of them. You know, I don't know what brand in particular. They might be like an open variety that a lot of people can grow, but they came from a grower called Blooming Nursery. And I'm going to look and see. It's Cornelius, Oregon is where they're grown. It's a uh, grower that my parents have bought from for a number of years and they grow things um, cold. So they don't grow a lot of things in, in the heated or anything. So a lot of the things are not ahead and that can be very beneficial, especially if, especially if you're planting this earlier on. So they're a lot tougher usually. Um, where, where's Cornelius Oregon though? <laughs> so they're growing close to Salem, Vancouver, Portland, so it's much more mild over there anyway, so they can grow colder and not be as affected as if they grew them over here. I think Walla Walla does the same thing, don't they grow cold too? And um, mm -hmm. moss does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so things are more conditioned. But anyway, they've got a beautiful selection and really fun stuff. But again, I don't know where that variety came from. It might just be an open one that several growers can can get a hold of. And that's the thing, and I think I explained that in the video, there's just so many different options out there. And maybe you are able to get the exact varieties that I show in a video, but there are a lot of really fun ones to try out there. And so anyway, kind of fun to show some of those. Katie said, will it hurt a newly planted tree to plant perennials under it? How long should one wait to underplant a newly planted tree? Also, do you worry about planting perennials or bulbs or annuals, whatever, so close to a newly planted tree? Doesn't the tree need some space and time to get its own roots established and not be overcrowded by other plants, also vying for all the nutrients in the soil? Um, I don't think that that matters so much, like nutrients, as if you're properly fertilizing things. The only trees that we really plant heavily under that were new were the red point maples. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't plant right on top of the root balls except for in that area because I'm only planting down just a tiny bit and it's only like in two spots. I wouldn't want to totally disrupt the entire surface area um, right there or plant like big things that could wreck a big portion of the root ball. Um, usually I go out a little like for perennials that I'm planting, daylilies that are near a tree. I'm not actually getting into right where that root ball originally was. But I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Uh, I think you can plant perennials the same day that you planted a tree. It, I don't... Yeah. I mean, fertilize stuff. Yeah. Fertilize it once or twice a year. Yeah. Make sure it's got proper water. So yeah. That... Throw some compost down once a year, mm -hmm. you know, around the root balls yeah. of your stuff. It'll help. Yeah. Don't worry about it too much. Uh, next video was planting shade window boxes and new chairs for the Hartley. So I planted the window boxes and containers in the portico area. So it's like kind of by our great room doors mm -hmm. and I really love how those arrangements turned out oh I just I think they've got a really interesting vibe this year and I, it could be the addition of the palms that made them look more like southern they or are a vibe is what you mean to say more tropical or something <laughs> but I like the colors and the the mixture of texture <laughs> of foliage there with the ferns and the palms and the do you like the structure though I do the structure is just a fabulous fabulous structure um, and then we had the chairs delivered for the Hartley. Um, so we wanted to get those unboxed and set up a little bit. Anyway, it was really fun. Sandra said, just one opinion on the pad colors. So that's the chair pad covers that I got uh, versus the pad color that they came with. The light color pads draws your eye to the air conditioner. The dark pads draw your eyes to the beautiful stone floor. I, I agree with you 100%. I did cover all of them. And once I got them all covered and I got all of the pillows that my parents got me for my birthday put um, in there, it just looks so complete and pretty. I did post a picture on Instagram and, and Facebook. It's a picture, kind of a weird one. I was standing outside the Hartley looking through the glass. It was the only way I could really get, like, I wanted to get I don't know, the chandelier in there with the table in the center and the, and the chairs. Anyway, yeah, I think they all look really pretty. Carrie said, did anyone notice the light flickering on and off? Oh, yes, that light. Just the one, though. It's not, it's not, it doesn't have a short or yeah. anything. It's just the filming, like. I saw that the, comment a lot. I know, yeah. It just has to do with the frame rate of the camera and the frequency of the bulb. And it can look like a flicker, but it's not actually flickering. It's a in, different bulb than the other one? Yeah, it might be a different brand. We need to get know. whatever the other one has that doesn't flicker, we need to 
Well, it doesn't basically. flicker in real life. No, it doesn't flicker it, in real just life. Just on the camera. Yeah. So what in the future, <laughs> what I'll do is I'll tell Ken to grab just a screenshot of the bulb and then overlay that over the video so mm -hmm. that it just the it's just a photo of the bulb instead of an actual moving picture mm -hmm. and then it won't won't flicker anymore. What a pain though. It is kind of a pain. I've done that in the past uh -huh. uh, to lights that are like, if they're flickering real hard mm -hmm. or whatever. So it's just one extra step. But yeah, it is kind of annoying it to is. see it. When I was watching that video back before I posted it, I was like, oh, wait for it. We're going to yeah. get a slew of comments about this light, yeah. but there was nothing we could really do right. at that point in time because I was reviewing the video late at night, <laughs> the I day before. I could have. You would have had to it. spend a bunch of time doing that though. It wouldn't have taken that long. Really? Yeah. I mean, a few minutes. I could, I could have fixed it. Are you serious? Are you serious? You just need to tell me that things take hours. I wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, okay, well, just don't worry about it. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> uh, Trevor said, those shades are exactly what we are wanting for our sunroom. Can you share where you got them from? Those were uh, add-ons uh, from Hartley. So they're like specific to... Which we can't really give our thoughts on yet. Um, they're kind of a little bit of a pain in the butt mm -hmm. to open and close. Mm -hmm. And there's... 10 of them because there's five shades on the front and five on the back. Yeah, you're right. Um, so I actually am getting a bid from a guy locally who does automatic blinds where at the press of a button, they all open. You can right do right now. It's like a boat sail. Like, yeah. And then you have but to, you have to pull pretty hard. You do. Like, and the ropes are not like yeah. comfortable. And you can't just keep like walking, walking it back. You have to kind of like pull it and it's, you know, <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to get a bid. I don't know how, it'd probably be pretty expensive to get automatic blinds, but I just want to know what it would cost. Yeah, it would be nice, um, especially for the ones right in the center. That, so the ones on the sides, you pull and they go uh, down. Mm -hmm. No, they go up. They go up yeah. as you pull them. The ones in the center where the chandelier, chandelier is, they come down and you have to be pretty careful. Like The nice thing about the Hartley blinds, whatever brand they are, whatever they sell, is they look really good when they're down. Yeah. They just hide and you don't see them. And that's the one thing I don't want to mess with with automatic blinds. Mm -hmm. I don't want it really to be visible when right. you're not using them. Mm -hmm. So they do look nice. They do. They have a specific look. Like they kind of bow in a little bit, which gives it yeah. a, like a romantic feel. Right. I do like that. Elizabeth said, I have asked this before, but not had an answer. Would you do it? Uh, why do you have your outside lights on during the day? Cause I like it. <laughs> Is it an American thing? Nope. I love your videos and I hope you don't think I'm being rude. I don't think you're being rude. I think a lot of people ask, well, a lot of people do ask that question. That question. We use LED bulbs. They're not using a ton of energy. Mm -hmm. I like the way it looks even during the day. And so it's a small thing that I do that brings me joy. Yeah. That's why. Uh, Chris, Chrysanthia, all things glam. Am I saying that right? <laughs> A crazy slant, but is there any way you could put a metal or wicker cover over the AC unit rather than hiding it? It's all white and throwing off the vintage aesthetic. The gray color complements the pillow that your mo uh, mom got you. However, I choose a complementary color from that pillow cover that pops and doesn't give a machi vibe. What's that? What's a machi? Machi vibe? Matchy? Matchy. Oh, matchy vibe? And well, it's spelled with a capital M, A C H I. Hmm. Maki that seems vibe? Like, yeah, I don't Maki? know. I absolutely love the urns on the side of the doorway porch and those window boxes. Um, dress, oh my goodness, dress up the seating area and voila. This Hartley is my go-to for you. Uh, this Hartley is my go-to for YouTube right now. I cannot wait to see its completion. Um, admire you immensely. That's really sweet. Um, okay. The AC unit. We can paint that. I just, I want to get a professional to do it. I do not want to do it myself. One, I don't know, Erin, how intro or how difficult it would be to remove the AC unit, like in the winter time, and have it dipped because our oh. AC unit guy uh, said our, you could said you could have the pieces well, dipped. Well, I think I think it stays in place. I think you unscrew it, and I think that the panel comes off. So if we could do that, that would probably be the cleanest way. Yeah, we could probably like you could dip it. You know, but you could also probably just take it to, you know, like an auto body place and they Have could just sprayed. spray it. Yeah. But the wicker thing is possible because you really only need the top part of it to be. Because it's shooting out the top. It there shoots is. out the yeah. top. I mean, because it's like, it's just like every mini split yeah. where. So the wicker thing could work and it might look nice. 
It might, but it or, would also Or a metal look... grate. You could do the same thing. You could do something like a really ornate metal grate. But even then, you would see pops of that white showing through because it is pretty bright. It was so great, though. Yesterday, it was a pretty hot day, and my brother came by for a little while just to chat, and we sat in there, and he was able to sit right by the ace unit. We had all the, the um, shades pulled, but it was right in the middle of the day, the hottest part, and it was doable Yeah. in there. Like, it well, was comfortable. I had it set to 75 when you guys were in uh -huh. there, too, so you could set it lower and have yeah. it be even more right. comfortable. But to have it so hot and have it be like, it wasn't like interior temperatures. I'm not sure that it was at, s at 75 with the sun beating through the window where you're sitting. I'm not sure. Um, it wasn't like I would want to live in that temperature, but it yeah. was comfortable to sit in. Yeah. Janet said, isn't the Hartley a greenhouse? Supposed to be for growing plants, not to make it a room. I think you can make a space whatever you want it to be. We're standing in a studio that was once a barn, a horse barn. Um, you can make a shed either a place to store things or you can make it a she shed or you can make it a, a bat cave. <laughs> Aaron wants a, he wants an underground like bat cave I lair. I do real bad. Real bad. Um, <laughs> anyway, so you can make a space whatever you want it to be. You know, we have the plastic greenhouse, which is the first thing we did at this house when we moved in. Um, best, well, that was one of the best things that we added to this property. It's been so useful. But last fall, you know, we uh, retrofitted it to make it a heated greenhouse so I can do a lot of my dirty projects in there. Seed starting. A lot of the stuff that you know requires like soil all over the ground and and water everywhere um, i can do that in that structure so i am very blessed to be able to do that in that area instead of in the hartley in the hartley i will have a lot of plants in there eventually but i'm so i'm a very slow mover when it comes to setting up spaces so it's not like i i thought it would be so awesome to make a video where i've got a blank space and then i just like yeah. poof boop, 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 it's boop, set up but one, it costs a lot of money to do that, so it takes me time to, to do that. I don't have all the pieces gathered up right away, and I wanna see like how the table fits the space once it arrives, and then the countertop, I think, will be installed in the next maybe couple of days, week or so. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to get the big pieces in there first that are more permanent um, so that I could see how much space I have to add in the plants that I want to add. And we are going to use it as a place to entertain. We're going to have the table and chairs in there where the four of us can eat dinners or breakfast or whatever and use that space that way, but then also have citrus in there. I've got a passion vine I want to put in there. It's sitting right to the right of me. Um, so that space will evolve, but it's going to be slow because that's just how I operate. I like to add things in and make it feel like it's not all done all at once. It's fun. It's, you are a one step at a time kind I'm of girl. I'm about the journey sort of girl. Well, look at our South Garden. Yeah. Like we just plant one plant at a time. Yeah. We don't, we don't go through like you don't have one section where you're like, boom, done. No. No. Well, it's because I never have a plan either. Yeah. I don't, like to, I don't like to have a master plan that I'm working off of. I just, I just don't operate that way. Everybody's different. But... Anyway, all that said, uh, it will have plants in it, but it may not be the greenhouse. I mean, everybody would use it differently. It may not be the greenhouse you would set it up to be, but it will be the greenhouse that I love and we can use for lots of different things. Next video was June garden tour. The plants have been loving the rain. So we did the garden tours in two parts, kind of like we did in May, because we took a long time, like they were long tours. And we spent a little bit more time, you know, talking about some individual plants because everything has just been doing so great this spring. And then also just showing you all of the, we do have a lot of disaster areas too, a lot of areas that are just powder dirt still, or you can still see this trenching in the grass or, areas we still have yet to rip out and kind of redo. Um, so all of that, we talked about a lot of things. Uh, Christy said, Laura, you and Aaron read our minds. A long tour is what I need this, needed this morning. I'm pretty sure everyone agrees. We like when you have long tours and show us all the things you have going on. So many changes going on in your gardens. Take your time, we love it. Thank you from North Carolina. Thank you for that sweet comment. Uh, that's a perfect comment to read. Take your time. Oh. I feel like we do things so quickly and I know, you know, it's what we do for our work, so think changes just happen for us quick quicker because that's our job um but also it's i don't know i also like to take our time at the same time <laughs> i don't know when you say it's what we do for our work it's i don't feel like we've really worked though like since i quit the cable job it doesn't feel like work oh does it to you <laughs> Yeah, like it, when you compare it, work, it to I working mean, at the garden center. Oh yeah, it's it's different. Definitely different than working a nine nine. Well, for me it was like a seven thirty to six job every single day. Um, definitely different. I think that's what makes it not feel like work is that you do it on your 
your own your schedule. Own. Yeah. Yeah. And which it's is, more hours, yeah. but it doesn't feel. Harder. I was just thinking when you said work, I'm thinking the physical work of it. Oh, because yeah. Because that's it's, so much of my job is. Yeah. And well, now Paul and Bethany do a lot of physical work. But too, you would be but. doing it whether you had a camera on you or not. You'd right. be like, if you, if you could, mm -hmm. you know, if you could plant all day long, you would do that anyway. Yeah. So from that standpoint, that doesn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Derp said, at 1-1, one, one, what is the name of the huge shrub? The one you're talking about maybe removing or pruning into a tree. That is an instant karma elderberry. Amazing plant. I should do that here pretty quick. They kind of are like the same stature as a black lace. Yeah. And I don't think we knew that. No, I Planting thought they... Planting what them. What do they say for their, their mature size? Hold on, let me look this up really quick. What I say? I mean, that karma. seems like every bit as big as a black lace elderberry. It does, and they grow like a weed here. They're they're amazing. You know what we need to add are some lemony lace. We had yeah. those under the pines, and they were so pretty. Six to eight feet tall and wide. Oh, so yeah. Is that how big they are? Yeah, they I mean, feel maybe a little that. more. In our area, yeah. because we get so much sun, I wouldn't be surprised if it would you know cap out at ten. Well, and not even the mature, mature size, but the growth rate of those things. Yeah. I mean, that was just well, like sticks, you said, like, like a weed, like hip high this this spring, and yeah. it's already this massive shrub. So I need to get in there and really look, and I'm wondering if maybe, um, because we've been just continually cutting it back, if I've created a structure that will be conducive to being a tree. Oh right, there's probably or too many. Maybe I, or just, out. I need to plow around in there and just kind of see what's going on. Because I think that would that would be the solution to keeping it there, mm -hmm. is to create more of a... Uh, I feel like we're going to have to move it to the South Garden somewhere. Yeah, well, I think it's probably just going to have to come out and we'll just plant a new one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they grow so fast, they do. it's not really yeah. a big deal. Deborah said, I'm really interested in the no dig because I'm contemplating on doing that in my backyard. Are you going to be posting that? Yes, we sure will. Um, Paul's been asking, he's like, hey, you get, are you getting any more co uh, cardboard or have you been saving it? Uh, because I think he's enjoying kind of... Yeah. getting that done and it's working out really well in the back so far so we didn't water ever we didn't water down the cardboard and so far it's not a problem like everybody was like oh we did it's not get gonna a lot work of rain. it's gonna blow away we did have a rainy spring so maybe that helped yeah but either way i mean we just have drip mm -hmm. going to the areas that have the plants and we don't water the other stuff so mm -hmm. And the rain we've been getting is a lot for us, but it's not a lot for areas that get a lot of rain. Sure. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if you compare us to places that are rainy, they'd be like, oh, that's nothing. But to us, it's a lot. It's like a whole year's worth of rain we got. And yeah. <laughs> it feels like. Well, like we were talking to some people who said that they'll get like three to five inches at a time. And I mean, it'll flood. That's you know, half like that's, of our that's a lot. annual rate. <laughs> Yeah, at right, five. but like yeah. ours is like 11. But I want to say that we've already gotten like close to that. They said this it's year. an 80 year record, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, where am I at? Danielle said, Do you protect your roses in the winter? I didn't think most roses could survive zone five winters. That's pretty awesome if they just come back on their own like that. I do nothing to protect our roses in the winter. We are technically a zone six now, though. We've had fairly mild winters for the past four years, five mm -hmm. years maybe. We had that one weird winter, which we'll always talk about. Like, we'll always talk about the winter of, was it 14 or 15? Was 15, it the first year we were or here? 16? I don't know. No, it was either the first had year. Had 16, because we moved here in 16. Oh, 14 is when we started doing YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. 16, yeah, so it was the winter of 16 uh, where we got 52 inches of snow and negative temperatures. Yeah. And but prior to that, winters had been colder than they are now. Uh, but yeah, definitely more mild the past few years. So it goes off of, your zone goes off of a 10 year average. So the last few years have brought our average up to a zone six. We still plant mostly like we're a zone five because you can't really trust it. Mm -hmm. I guess exactly, but I did plant a zone six. What was it, Aaron, that I planted that we was a zone six? We did some black grasses. I remember that were a zone six. That mondo? Came, mondo grasses, yeah, they kept they coming back. back. Um, what else did I just plant that was a zone six? I feel like it was a perennial. Oh, I planted some Mavis Simpson uh, hardy geraniums. I only bought three because they were all rated to a zone six while I bought eight of the other varieties that I put out in the garden um, just to see what they would do because I'm still a little bit gun shy about the whole zone thing. 
Um, so no, I don't do anything to protect roses in the winter. Uh, I used to cut all of my roses back in the fall, actually, even with zone five winters, like true blue zone five winters, and they still did pretty good. Grafted roses were a little bit more tender because sometimes you would lose the top and then you would get the parent plant the, below the graft. Uh, there are rose collars that people were starting to use here several years ago. They're like, like corrugated plastic that you would put around the base of your roses and like clip them together on one side and then you could fill them with leaves and mulch. And then in the spring, you take the col collar off first and you let it sit and then you slowly, you know, move the mulch away from the crown of your plant. A lot of people just mound up leaves um, and mulch the same way without a collar, but I don't do a, a dang thing. We do a lot of our pruning though now in the spring instead of in the winter because we, we have things a little more organized <laughs> around here. And typically in the fall when I used to do it, now we're focused more on uh, Christmas lights. Ernesto said, Laura, why don't you propagate by yourself those plants that you have, but you want more? Just cut some stems right on the elbows or suckers too, put them in the soil in the greenhouse, water, and enjoy growing your most precious plants. If you want to increase the chances of surviving, you can add some growth promoter for roots. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we don't focus on propagating a lot is because there are so many plants out there now that it's actually illegal to propagate the plants on any level mm -hmm. whether you're doing it at home or you're doing it you know to you know propagate and sell the plants that's even worse but there are so many plants especially you know because we work with proven winners a lot that um, these plants have been bred hybridized it has nothing to do with GMOs but they're hybridized um, and to be better plants, to be like these monster, amazing growing plants, you know? And um, so- Or even, sometimes even not even monsters, sometimes the opposite, like- um, Yeah, a lot of shrubs have been- A lot been of shrubs pretty, have know. been miniaturized. Right. Because people don't have room for these, you know, 20 foot tall shrubs and they want- I was just thinking super tunias. So I'm yeah. thinking super tunia monster plants. Right. Um, yeah, you're right. A lot of plants right. are really easy to propagate, but it's, it's weird for us to promote something that is in many cases illegal. In, in a lot of cases, it's totally legal and they're just open varieties. You can propagate whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But in more and more cases, it, it's like, it's technically, it's weird because it's technically illegal, even though nobody's gonna come after you. Especially on a home gardener level. I think, yeah. I think if somebody's doing it, now, if in you're a growing, professional if you, yeah, if you have an operation with a greenhouse and you're selling them, don't do that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of messed that up. That is, that's messed up because you think about the people. It's not a big company that's breeding these plants. They are like, they're that breeding is their job, and mm -hmm. they might be breeding this out in their own home field, and they sell this this amazing plant. They sell the genetics to then the big company. So you're hurting this person who's poured their passion and and all of these years into breeding this plant mm -hmm. and that hurts them. It doesn't, you know, d d don't do that. But there are some cases like fall gold raspberries, for instance, I think they're an open variety. I should probably <laughs> check that out, but I cannot get my hands on enough of those to fill my bed. So you know how raspberries grow, they sucker out everywhere. And it's kind of like dividing your plants, mm -hmm. like even proving winners knows and in perennial cases, you're, after a certain amount of years, you need to divide that perennial. So you're cutting it in half, making it into two plants. Mm -hmm. So it's technically propagating, but you're making the plant healthier and that happens. So same with the fall gold raspberries, they sucker out, we let them grow to a certain size. We dig them up and plant them back in the bed so that we can make our row longer. So there are some cases where we do it, but a lot of times we just don't mess with it because it's a really kind of weird area for us to be mm -hmm. in. Um, also, my parents do have a garden center, so I, I have a, maybe an easier time getting a hold of plants than um, some do, and I'm very thankful for that. Thankful that my parents' garden center, like what they do, aligns so nicely with what my passion ended up being in life, mm -hmm. which is so weird because I thought I didn't think for so long that I would end up doing what I'm doing. Um, when you grow up gardening and not of your own free will, really, but like it was part of your chores to do it. And I do believe that kids should have chores and should help out with what's going on at home. Um, and our kids will have the same thing. They'll have chores. Benjamin is just like, he loves to, he help. Loves to help. He loves to have a job. I don't know what Samantha's going to be like, but she will have chores too. Um, but when you do that all your childhood, I thought I'm going to go into nursing or I'm going to do, that's what I thought I was going to do. I, I was going to go into a different field and not do anything remotely close to stuff outside and now it's like I can't get enough of it I, I don't know yeah it's like a switch I think it took me working at a bank job which is for some people but it was not for me because I didn't even have a window with what I was doing and it was just horrible and I just realized like this is not oh what I want <laughs> in life and so I needed to make a big switch and I did and um, anyway 
propagating. Why? <laughs> Why? I don't know. Anyway, let's move on. Katie said, you've mentioned that weeping willows are messy trees. If you put a pond underneath the tree, would it clog easy? It might. That is a consideration. You know, I'm also worried that if we dig a big hole right by that weeping willow, what is that root system like for the weeping willow? You know, Aaron has to pop out for a moment. Yeah, so anyway, I don't know if that's, that's where we will put a pond. And also, I think I mentioned, maybe I mentioned when I was talking about the pond, I like to have garden features spread out a little bit. And I don't know if putting a pond right there, right next to where the Hartley is going to be in the formal gardens, I mean, maybe it would look awesome. But again, I'm such a slow mover that I kind of need to see the gardens around the Hartley form up before I can think about adding another large feature like that. And then also we did purchase the property um, like kitty corner to our house. So it aligns with the South Garden there. It's on the other side of the lane. And we've thought that we've thrown out the idea of maybe putting a pond over there. I don't, there's a lot of things that we've talked about and I just don't know what we're gonna do in the end, but um, a pond somewhere eventually would be nice. I would like that. Next video, oh, Aaron's back. Yeah. Okay, next video is the June tour of our South Garden. It's coming together quickly. So that was the second part of the garden tour where we showed the South Garden, the cut flower garden, the flower shed, and where we're at with stuff out there. Alicia said, Laura and Aaron, watching your journey over the last several years has been inspirational. Transforming your beautiful home into such an amazing space is uh, in such a short time is certainly no small feat. I can't wait to see where it goes in the next several. Cheers. Thank you for such a sweet comment, Alicia. You know, it really does, like if you really stand back and take a look at what you've, like what we've accomplished in that mm -hmm. space, it really is incredible. Yeah. But I feel like as humans, we always have that list, that running list of things that we haven't done yet mm -hmm. um, and the jobs that we need to get done. And it should be opposite, right? We should be reveling in like the awesome things that have, yeah. have happened. It takes a balance though. like. You got to have that list and that work, the, the work has to happen in order for the things to get done. But anyway, it is pretty incredible. All the things out there and how fun. It's just been fun. Anna said, it's a huge plot. Love watching you guys. We live in Lincolnshire, UK. We are looking at a Hartley and there are so many beautiful designs. Any tips on your purchase? Well, I love ours. I mean, what would you say? <laughs> well, I like that? the dark ones too. I like the, I too. the black ones. We kind of, like we tossed up. Like, yeah. do we do a black I kind of think we could have got away with a black one. We could have, but white with our white house, white, white barn, is white chicken coop, it just felt like, and yeah. it's, for me, it was such a, almost a nostalgic purchase. Is that a weird way to describe it? But I've been looking in the English Garden Magazine since I was little um, at the ads for the mm -hmm. Hartley Botanic Greenhouses. And then I stood in one, it wasn't white, it was cream colored, but I stood in the exact model that we purchased in uh, Beetham at Beetham mm -hmm. Nurseries in the UK when we were visiting. And I don't know, I, that white just, just seems so classic and yeah. it does fit our structures, but they are beautiful, the black ones. Yeah. So here's what I would say if you're, if you're not sure what size you want, you know, if you already, chances are you already have had a greenhouse, like maybe a cheap, flimsy, you know, plastic one, like the, you know, three to $500 ones. And so you kind of know already what you know, how much space that is and how much you want to jump to. So, but I almost feel like you need to make that step first. Like you almost need to have a cheap greenhouse first to know what you want. Like we had this one, which was a pretty nice one. Um, and this, our plastic one is 20 by 36. Mm -hmm. And everybody always said buy, if buy what had the biggest one you can afford. We were, we were going back and forth between the one we got, which is the Grand Lodge mm -hmm. and the Grand Manor which is a little bit bigger. Yeah. I didn't want the Grand Manor because I don't like the roof pitch. Yeah. The roof pitch on that one is off to me. And the Grand Lodge just has like the, it has like the perfect proportions. Mm -hmm. And so while we thought about doing one a step bigger, I am really happy with how this one turned out. Yeah. Um, lots of customizations can be made. Like we put in two doors, the front and the back door. Uh, instead of just having the one. And I do really like that because it does help with traffic flow. Um, be, it, it depends on your space too. Like maybe you're backing it up against something and you don't need that, which gives you a lot more wall space inside, which would mm -hmm. be nice. Um, cold frames 
are a little bit harder to design around, I'm happy to have them because I think that will, I think it's a charming look, but in the back we don't have them and it's gonna be so beautiful to have containers and benches back there. So that all just depends. I think maybe the cold frames are gonna end up being sort of useless in the summer, um, but I think you're gonna really like them in the winter time. Yeah. We still haven't gone through a winter where we had it heated inside because mm -hmm. we made those holes to where the airflow can get in and we are gonna keep it heated all summer long or winter long, sorry. Mm -hmm. So I think that you're really gonna enjoy the cold frames yeah. in the winter because you won't be opening them and closing them all the time. Right. Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right now I don't have, so all the spring stuff has been cleaned out. And I just was telling Aaron this morning, I need to plant those up for the summer, but we don't have our drip system hooked up. It's run. Like we have the, the pipe tube. The drip is inside. We just need yeah. to trench the tube to the to the box. And we don't really want to trench the tube until we've planted the boxwoods and like figured out that corner area um, so I don't want to drag a hose to them every single day so yeah. we're just gonna wait until we're ready which means it'll probably be fall crops that I plant in there mm -hmm. um, the only unnecessary customization we added on which we didn't think was unnecessary at the time were the bug screens for the nets for the windows the bug nets for the windows um, which they were kind of expensive yeah they are being used, thankfully. They sat up in our loft forever, and it was kind of like this guilt thing that I would walk by and be like, oh my gosh, that was like, we thought. a lot of money. Yeah, and they were a lot of money, but Paul's dad actually took them, and he's using them for something, I don't know exactly yeah. what, but he's utilizing them. And I don't mind spending money on stuff as long as somebody else gets some use out of them or we get use out of them, whatever. I just don't want stuff to sit and not be used. Um, anyway, we just over time thought, well, we've got those windows that are louver, like they mm -hmm. open and close on their own. Bugs are gonna get in there. You can't put screens on those. Mm -hmm. So if we have screens on the other windows, what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> like bugs are gonna get in. That's a greenhouse, you know, in the end. It's not an inside, it's not a home. Um, so why- I do think that Hartley could do a better job of providing more examples of some of the, um, some of the add-ons that they sell. Like, like really the bug good screens. pictures. Like a lot of pictures. Yeah, we didn't, there were a lot of things that we weren't unsure of. I mean, we couldn't really find any really good examples in picture yeah. form or that sort of thing. Yeah. But happy with how everything, how everything turned out. So if you get further on in the process and you have any questions, just send us an email. Because I feel like we've actually had, there's a couple in town who came and looked because they, I think they want to get one a step down in size, I think. Um, but they came and looked at it right when the floors were finished up and then I'm gonna have them come back when I've got a little more set up so they can feel the space. And um, one of the questions she asked me was, okay, okay, you've done this whole process, what is something that you would do different? Are there any things that you would do different? What do I need to know? Mm -hmm. um, so bug screens are pretty much the only thing. You know, we can't answer everybody's question, just like anybody who's starting the process, but if you do wanna, if you're interested in Hartley Botanic specifically, if you've gone to the process of actually like getting a bid on like a specific size or something, we're more than happy to, to talk to you from at that point. If, if you've already kind of figured out the like, okay, the price is fine or whatever, but you just want to know how, how to tweak it or whatever, mm -hmm. then for sure send us an email and we'll, we'll help out. Carolina said it's looking like an actual garden already. Incredible transformation. Question, when it's so hard that not even water can go through, can roots grow there? Roots are incredible things. It's amazing. Roots grow through foundations. Yeah, they Think do. Think about that. Like through concrete. They break up the foundation of your house mm -hmm. or yeah, they'll break up concrete, so. Not all roots, but no. a lot of roots will. Um, with ours, because it's so hard pan out there in areas, in fact, where we replaced one of the arborvitas along the fence line out in the South Garden, that same one, the brand new one died again. Um, we pulled it out and it's just that hole just is like a little, Coffin. Yeah, it's like a water coffin. Like it go, the water goes nowhere. It takes days for this much water to mm -hmm. to um, seep into the soil. So there are some areas where it's a little tougher, and I think you probably need to like rip that soil. Like really. I think I'm gonna go out there with. Um, uh, we have some like really long, small drills. I'm gonna go out oh. there and, and drill like really deep. That's a good idea. You're aerating and, the trees, Aaron. Yeah. 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 That's a great idea. They just provide more avenues for the water to travel. Right. And that's the only spot. All the rest of them are looking great. Even the poor ones that we left in yeah, the ground. Yeah, there's a couple we almost replaced yeah. and they're coming out of it. They are. It kind of makes me think like maybe we, well, that one that we replaced was pretty, pretty I think that was bad. bad. Um, but yeah, that's, plants are pretty resilient, but that one spot, a lot of times when you have hard pan, once you start irrigating in this space, it does soften up 
quite a bit, but then you'll have cases like ours where it doesn't. Well, it was tough because all the rest of them, I mean like 98% of them, 99% of the ARBs are doing really well with the amount of water we're giving them. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to alter the water for just mm -hmm. one. Right. So I really think that there's something wrong just in that I'm one interested. Area. I would like to be out there when you aug that hole. Yeah. Because I wonder, like you're gonna aug it and then probably just fill it with the hose and just see how long it takes for the water to go down. I probably won't even fill it with the hose. I'll probably just try to drill several holes in that spot. You don't and wanna get test some the water. Of that dirt. You wanna test to see how long after you aug the holes the water takes to go away before you plant something new in there. Don't you think? Maybe, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Just test it out because yeah. if the water still sits in that hole, you don't want to put another poor plant in there. Right. We'll have to figure out something else. Drain the water away. Yeah. It's weird. Uh, Randy said, I know you've mentioned possibly a water feature in the cut flower garden, but have you ever thought of a tall, thin tree? Just a thought. Um, you know, I haven't really considered a tree. I've been really just not considering trees around that area at all. I mean, I suppose you could do something like that, but... I don't know how the view would look like to the cut flower shed. I mean, if it's a fountain and it's more shaped like this, it seems a little bit more like appropriate uh -huh. structure for the space instead of something that's like cutting your vision off like this. I don't know. Uh, Bianca said, what happened to all the bulbs that were planted in the orchard? I've been dying to see them in bloom. Well, it was kind of a wah wah sort of situation. Uh, we think a couple of different factors. One, I think the bulbs might have been planted like a touch too deep, possibly. We also didn't have um, enough moisture this winter and it was really mild. So a lot, of, they all came up, but like the daffodils were this tall. Mm -hmm. Like, or some of them didn't have stems at all. It was just a yellow flower, like out the soil surface right here. We got right all here. our moisture after they bloomed. Yeah, we did. So they're all still there. Um, and I'm hoping once we have irrigation set up in there that they will come up and be beautiful. I do plan on putting some taller ones in there though. Here's my plan. So the sprinklers are all flagged. Benny's supposed to come any day now and put the sprinklers in there. I want to seed a specific type of grass in there that I can let get, you know, like this tall. But in the fall, I want to go in and mow it fairly short, like uh, for a last mowing. Like when you do the lawn for mm -hmm. the last time, go in and do the orchard for the last time as well. So that it, the grass just sits through the winter short so that those short blooms can still come up in the spring because they're so early, they come up before the grass really starts to grow. They can come up and look beautiful and then they'll kind of start dying back. And then I'll put some late daffs in mm. there that are taller. So once the grass starts to grow, we'll have a second show of daffodils in there that are that are taller. So that's kind of the thought process. Sure. And in the end, I kind of just want like a little paths mode to the trees or kind of like a little pathway mode through the area. I don't know, it'll evolve. Right now, we were able to handle the weeds in the space, like they're all mowed back because the duck left and her babies. Um, so at least it's kind of slicked up for now. Martha said, thank you for the wonderful garden tours. Have you planted any wajilla? I have a tricolor wajilla with pink blooms planted in front of my black lace elderberry. They are both blooming now and really complement each other very well. In your south garden, it would be quite lovely to pair these together. It would be pretty. I don't have any of those planted out in the south garden. I've got one in our garden. We need here. to do that uh, checkmark trilogy. Yeah. We, that was like a really nice looking shrub mm -hmm. and we planted it and forgot to run water to it. We one should day, plant that again. One day in our area in the summer, if you don't run drip or you don't water your yeah. plant in, it'll die. Um, Although it's probably two days. You think it was two we days? Forgot. It was, it was hot. It was hot. Yeah. But your sister, we gave her some of that variety yeah. and she sent us pictures this spring yeah. um, of how pretty they are. Dad man dude said, looks lovely. Question about the drip irrigation. How do you blow all those lines out in the winter before the freeze comes? Do you have issues with frozen or busted lines? Nope. Um, drip lines just, they weep all the water out naturally. So we don't blow those out. The only thing we blow out is the actual like irrigation system, just like a normal sprinkler system, but not the drip lines. A. Deegan said, why don't you plant more weeping willows? They do so well in your area and you have the space and lots of neighbors to block. The thing about weeping willows is they have to be treated with a systemic insecticide every single year or they get borers and they die. Um, and so I don't really want to add more of those to our landscape, even though I love the ones that we currently have uh, because I don't want to have to chemically treat our trees. We do um, them at the appropriate time. You do them after they're done blooming. So the bees have already done their thing. There's nothing for pollinators to attach them or feed on, I guess, mm. on the tree. So you do it right after that. And then you're not hurting your pollinators. A lot of 
things that you can use chemically and stuff out in the garden. You just have to use them appropriately and responsibly. Um, and then I'm fine with a lot of things, but I don't really want to, with that knowledge, add more of that stuff to the garden space. Mm -hmm. So we'll just enjoy the ones that we have. And they're actually a little bit hard to get hold of. You really don't see them for sale in this area. No, anymore. they're very weak trees. I mean, they are a messy tree. They lose little limbs every single time we have a wind. Um, and I'm guessing at some point along the way, we'll get a windstorm to like fierce enough to just break one right in half. I'm yeah. expecting that it's going to happen one day. So um, I will be super bummed if that ever happens, but it, it will. So I'm just, I'm a realist in yeah. that way. It will happen. Uh, last video is almost done with our annual planting projects, uh, landscape pots and window boxes. It was just a day of like, let's get these things in the ground. I knee jerked a little bit on our college job and I ordered a lot more plants than we actually needed because last year I didn't. Um, last year I had to pull plants from a lot of our own personal projects and I had to get stuff in at the garden center. It was a kind of a cobbled job uh, because I just didn't realize how much I was going to need. So I ordered way too many, uh, which is fine. We were able to use them here and we were able to use them in other areas too. And I gave a lot to um, like Bethany took some down to the fairgrounds and used them down there. We plant some at our parents' homes and things like that. So Christy said, I just want to say thank you to you and uh, all involved for the two hours of your garden walk and chat the last two days. It was wonderful. It's nice to see how everything is coming together. Your property is absolutely gorgeous. Thank you for your inspiration and encouragement. It really motivates me to get all the things done in my gardens. This channel has brought me so much happiness. Love from North Carolina. That is so sweet. Garden tours seem to be things that you guys enjoy. So I'm thankful for that. It's kind of fun to walk around the garden and have record. Yeah. It's fun to, if you guys ever have the time or the desire, you can go back and watch. We did our first garden tour in four parts mm -hmm. um, when we first moved in here and it's crazy. Also, I am embarrassed by how badly filmed they were. Oh, well, So I don't think they'll notice that over how poorly I presented these <laughs> probably. So yeah. Uh, but at least you could see what the garden looks like when we first moved in. Rainford Farm said, hey guys, I just love everything about your vibe. So gorgeous. Question, how, what do you use for fertilizer on your beds and how often do you fertilize? Also, are you developing the property to create an event center? Um, we use Biotone when we plant things. And then in the spring, we go through with Plantone, Hollytone, you rose, go, tone. rose tone um you are soil acidifier yeah aaron's really diligent about the this. only thing that i've started to use less of for espoma products is the iron tone um i still spread that on the grass from time to time but i don't plant i don't use as much iron tone i've i've used more chelated iron hmm. which is not an organic and mm -hmm. that's why espoma doesn't sell it they may one day but um but yeah chelated it's... iron is like the only thing in our area that we can that really gets the plants to take it up. It's like our pH is too high to where mm -hmm. they just won't take up the iron, like normal iron. And chelated, chelated iron is different from the regular. It's just iron that has been like, I don't know, broken like down a, yeah, into like a- ready to use. It's been broken down or made into a, uh, into a form that can be readily taken up into a plant like, like that, no, no matter what kind of pH your soil is, yeah. which is what we need. It's more of a quick fix though. It's not like something you really want to keep working on your soil, you know, and uh, organic matter and compost and things like that. Add yeah. those things in to help condition your soil and the pH down. Soil acidifier also does help with that, but you just have to be really diligent about keeping up on it. Mm -hmm. And then also giving your plants the quick shot that they need because sometimes they can't wait as long as it takes your soil to condition down properly. Well, some, and some plants don't need it. You know, mm -hmm. there are just some things that are more susceptible to iron deficiency than mm -hmm. others. Right. Hydrangeas, maple trees. Maples. Mm -hmm. No. Karen said, what happened to, I don't want to remove the spring pansies because they look good still. Well, I didn't want to remove the pansies. A lot of those things um, get rehomed. Bethany mm -hmm. takes a lot of things to rehome them and it doesn't necessarily go to her, her own home. She'll rehome them all over the place. Um, when you see a day that's 104 in the forecast, yeah. you know it's certain death for those plants. Uh -huh. So you might as well just pull them out. Yeah, if, you have, if you have the it. time to get them swapped out, you just got to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it. It's hard some years to do that. I do have three pots that still have pansies in them. So those will probably go here in the next few, couple of days. Valerie said, another great video. Questions, what size drip tube did Paul run in the South Garden area and how long do you run it typically? We have a three quarter inch 
supply line that like feeds to each area and then we spider off of that with half inch drip tubing. Occasionally we, we, we run a quarter inch drip tube to a specific plant if it doesn't make sense, if it wastes water to go from, because we use a half inch brown drip tubing with drip holes every 12 or 18 inches. We've used mm -hmm. both out there. Um, but if we need to like spider off it and go way a distance to another tree to water that, um, a lot of times we won't use the drip tube if there's no plants it's running by, so we're not just wasting water out there. We'll run a quarter inch to it and do an individual emitter. We've tried to be as efficient as possible. However, you can only run the quarter inch about 25 feet. Right. After but that. 25 feet of drip tube with holes every 12 inches, like that's an incredible waste of water that's going yeah. to feed nothing but weeds. Right. Um, so if we can get away from doing that, then we don't do that. Once a day for 30 minutes, twice a day for 15 minutes. I know temperature and wind factors in, but would love to know the thought process. We will do it anywhere from like 20 minutes to an hour, depending on what types of plants are in there, how mm -hmm. much drip was run. You know, if you run less drip, you're gonna to need to run it for more often. If you mm -hmm. run more drip, you'll run it for less amount of time. Mm -hmm. It just, it's so dependent on like, have you had wind? If it's been windy, you probably need to do it longer. Has it been dry? Probably need to do it longer. Has it been raining? You know, maybe you got a little bit of rain. So you kind of need a system where you can go in and like alter it mm -hmm. or turn it off or, you know, it's it's not a set it and forget it. Mm -hmm. You can't just leave it automated and let it, oh, you can, you know, but if you really want to dial it in, you have to go out and check your soil. Mm -hmm. and, and after a while you start to know like, oh, it's been this windy, I probably need to run it for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, it's not, you just have to do it. It's trial by fire, yeah. you know. Turn, turn it on for five minutes, see what it does. Mm -hmm. Well, probably not enough. Do it for 10 minutes. Yeah. We do a lot of that. So a lot of our time in the evenings with the kids and the kids love it. We drive around on the gator or the golf cart and we drive, drive the flower beds and we just look at things yeah. and um, the kids are having a great time, you know, because they're yeah. getting to go on a ride and we are able to really monitor what things are doing. So we'll be going along and I'll be like, oh, the cabbage looks wilty. I think we need to run that that zone for maybe 10 minutes or something, mm -hmm. give them a little bit of extra water to get them through. Um, but it's, I think we have honed our water usage so much mm -hmm. because we are, we're very hands-on with it. Yeah. Um, but like Aaron said, you know, some areas I showed you in this video, how Paul ran that drip for the annuals. And we ran a ton, like Paul ran a ton in that area. Um, so that we don't have to turn that one on very long. Um, and that's pretty nice. Yeah but not every area is like that. Yeah. So, Rhea said, you may have overlooked the most important garden tool of all, right next to the augers. How exactly do you use the mower slash sword combo? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Benjamin calls that his shanger. Yeah. It's not a sword, it's a shanger, because it makes the shang, shang yeah. sound. And now uh, Samantha makes the shang sound. Does she? It's so cute, yeah. Oh, Benjamin. Steve Earl is the best, says, is it just me or is this the best season of garden answer ever? Laura, I can watch you plant stuff all day, every day. I'm on maternity leave and have a 10 month old baby that doesn't get to watch TV except our garden videos in the morning. He loves it and perks up when he hears, hey guys, how's it going? I think it's why he enjoys our daily garden tours at our house. Thanks for doing what you guys do. That is so sweet. A 10 month old little dude. Yeah. Aw, that's so cute. And I think, in fact, we were just talking about how like clean it is in here. And I just told Aaron, like, I feel like I've been better this year about like getting, keeping on top of tasks like that, that past years I've just kind of let go because like physically I was just so either spent or pregnant and I'm neither of those things this <laughs> year that um, it feels good. Like I feel like I've utilized t downtime a little bit better to keep on top of keeping things. I mean, things get unorganized. You've seen it. I've showed it to you, but I've been a lot quicker about taking it under control and making sure that things don't get out of control. Um, but there are years where it's not like that years where I had an infant or years where like last year, no year before last when I was pregnant with Samantha, I had three ribs out mm -hmm. almost my entire pregnancy. I'd go get them adjusted back in and they would immediately pop back out. And I was just in physical pain the whole time. And I just felt like things were, so I feel like between having more energy to tackle things and having rain and having cooler temperatures, it's just, and having amazing help. Like, I think that all those things aside that I just yeah. talked about. The best help this we year have than we've ever the had. the best team here that we could ever, like, pray for, hope for, mm -hmm. wish for. And there's no way that Aaron and I could have two small kids at home and have a property this size and keep on top of any of it. Like, something would suffer really, yeah. really bad. So it's all a matter of, like, getting people in place that are, are really 
like they're key. They're mm -hmm. key to the operation here and we couldn't do it without them. So anyway, that's it for today's recap video. You can probably, I don't want to say 100% expect these to be regular again on Sundays. Um, but probably. But probably. Uh, now that it's going to be hotter and we'll want to be inside a little bit more, it'll be a lot easier to um, a lot time to be in here. And it's always nice to kind of catch up and go through some of these questions. And it always feels weird. It like throws me off when we don't stay on our consistent schedule. I don't like it. So thank you guys for watching. Hope you're having a great day. Have a great week and we will see you in the next video. Bye.